Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this week's Everton show. It's been an eventful week for so for the Toffees, hasn't it? It always is, with FA Cup progress, a £13 million new signing and a Premier League victory against Newcastle United. To try and make sense of all that, and I use that term very loosely, we've got Graeme Stewart in the studio this week. What a week, just what we needed. It was uh, coming off the back of the disappointment of our exit in the Capital One Cup at Manchester City and all the controversy that surrounded that. We needed the lads to pick us all up and they did that in perfect style. The away win at Carlisle in the Cup, a decent fifth round draw for me as well away at Bournemouth. And then obviously the nice midweek game Wednesday night against Newcastle, which was saw us get a, a more than welcome three points. So the lads have done us proud. It just brings back the feel good factor because undoubtedly things were potentially about to get a little bit fractious. Yeah, they could have been if it had all gone wrong, you know. I mean, it's, it's banana skin tie at, up at Carlisle, wasn't it? The TV cameras there, obviously, for the reason, thinking that there might be that banana skin. But that early goal from Aruna Kone, you know, gave us everybody a nice settling feeling. Uh, Aaron Lennon scored a magnificent goal, brilliant first touch for the second one. And Ross finished it off. So, And then to get the three points against Newcastle was the icing on the cake. And this guy joined us as well, and we'll bring you Omar Nias's first ever interview in a royal blue jersey in a short while. And as we progress through this week's Everton show, we'll also hear from these charming people. I hope that we can make our, our fans enjoy our football, enjoy our wins, and, and, and make sure that everyone is proud of, of this good group of players that, in my eyes, are one of the most talented squads that we, we've ever had. I'm a fighter. I can say I, I always give my best in the pitch, so that's made me to never give up. So I have something in my mind or who said me you can do it at any time. Just playing with a bit of confidence now and I felt comfortable doing that and for the last pen, but the main thing was just winning the game and we did that and we kept the clean sheet, which is a confidence boost for the whole team. When we got back to Belfield, we all had to go to uh, the pub for a pint, even if it was only just one. You know, it was one or two stay for three or four, <laughs> but usually it was just the one. It's never been an easy place to go stalking. Uh, as I say, it's, it's, the next two games are crucial um, and we we'll, we'll look forward to them. Another packed Everton show for you this week. Well, only Romelu Lukaku and Marouane Fellaini have cost Everton Football Club more than the £13.5 million it took to prize Omar Nias away from Locomotive Moscow. We may not know a great deal about him, but the Senegalese international striker brings with him a pretty impressive football CV. And judging by his inaugural Finch Farm sit-down with the Everton show, he seems happy enough to be here. It's a great day for me. It's a very great day because it was a dream for me to be in uh, Premier League and uh, it's a big dream also to be in Everton. So I'm very, very happy and excited to be here. But I hope just everything going to be well for the next uh, four, four, and year, four, four years. What do you know about Everton as a football club? As a club, I just know it's, it's one of the big clubs here about history, about fans and about also like players, they have good players, especially they have a good young players and this is something who can make you like to feel it's a good team and it's good environment because if you see players like 20, 20 years, 21, to be very, very, very performant like that, you know they have good coach and they have also a good environment. So that's all I can see about players, about players and also they have good mix because they have also some players over 30 years and they still be good. So you can see it's it's like a good family, I think. I didn't, I, I didn't meet them, but that's what I'm seeing from outside. You, you're a forward, you score goals, mm -hmm. you set up goals, you create goals. What is your preferred position? Through the middle, out wide? You can play in quite a few positions. I'm moving a lot in front. Okay? Like in locomotive, I'm playing when I, these last two years, I'm playing almost uh, alone up front. But I'm always moving to give like, the space for the winger to come behind me or for the midfielder. So like I like I like if I have the opportunity to score, I, I I'm gonna go forward to score. But if I don't have it, I will try to make like to to give my like the good position for the other players, like the winger or the midfielder who coming behind me. I leave them the space. Sometimes I move to the left. I like to move to the left, but from the middle to the left, I can move and give a lot of good ball or go to score. What do you believe is your best quality, your best attribute? Mm, I'm speed and I'm strong. I'm strong and I'm strong, but this is something you you can have for your like your your quality. But I think it's in my head. I'm very like I'm a fighter. I can say I I always give my best in the pitch. So that's made me to never give up. So I have something in my mind or who said me you can do it at any time. 
that's I think is my first quality in my mind. Well, by and large, despite the best efforts of Sky Sports News, deadline day passed by relatively quietly. There were a few deals that captured the imagination, but I would think that Evertonians closed the window with a bit more satisfaction than most. As usual, Roberto had done his homework thoroughly. His judgment was back to the hilt, and Everton had their man. <laughs> Okay, guys, do you want a quick photograph over here? Robert, do you want to do the first one? Yes. Quick test, guys. Right, gentlemen, just wait for me, please. That's great. Yeah, boys, assistant manager on yeah, here with yeah. the little <laughs> mark. Come on, don't take all the credit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tony Ender. Oh, here we go, here we go. That's right. Well done now, relax yeah. now. Yeah, well done. Okay guys, out the camera. Brilliant. Did you speak with Jimmy? Have all your number? No. no? no which one would you? I don't know which one is sweet. <laughs> I'm a fighter. I can say I, I always give my best in the pitch, so that's made me to never give up. So I have something in my mind or who said me you can do it at any time. That's I think is my first quality in my mind. A little look behind the scenes there with our new man Omar Nias. And as I said earlier, Graham, we don't know a great deal about him, but the clips I've seen on YouTube, and YouTube can be deceptive, but yeah. he scores some goals. He has scored some goals, and um, you know he said himself there he's fit. He's strong. I like the thing, the, uh, the bit there where he says he's hungry, mm. and and you know all Evertonians will love that in in any player that comes to our football club. But uh, we wish Omar every success. There will be a settling in period, I would imagine. He's come from Russia. He's a Senegalese international striker. It might take him time to adapt to the English way of life, the Premier League way of life. Yeah, I think so. It's a big move for him, isn't it? So we have to afford him that that little bit of time to settle in. Um, we hope he'll make an immediate impact, but I think we've got to be patient with him. And clearly he's going to be one for potentially next season rather than this season. You know, we, we'd, we'd like to think he'll add something, but I think we'll probably see the best of him next season. Let's hope he can have the sort of impact that your old mate Daniela Macacci had. Yeah, Ramo was an infectious kind of character. Um, he never really knew what was going to happen with Daniel. <laughs> and uh, if we didn't know, Defender <laughs> certainly didn't know. So all in all, he was a, he was a great pa package, lovely, friendly guy and uh, always good to catch up with him. And thanks to One Afternoon at Ellen Road, an Everton legend for life. Well, Roberto's record in the transfer market stands up against the best of them. Time will tell as to whether or not the boss has unearthed another gem, but for the time being, he's just delighted to have captured a quality footballer who's been on his radar for quite a while. He's a player that we've been following for a long time and you'd never know if you'll be able to, to clinch the deal and, and, and finish it off. And I must admit that the, the way that he arrived at, at Finch Farm, he feels, uh, he feels a really... Uh, right personality in a very good moment of his career. Uh, someone that is, has had a lot of success in Russia, has been voted the best uh, player in the Russian league. And it brings uh, a little bit of a different type of quality that we, are, uh, we have in our squad already. So really pleased to be able to, to bring um, Omar at this window and knowing that he's going to have a massive impact going forward and bringing a real desire and hunger to be successful. In, in what's a very strong squad already. We know he can play on the wing and as a main striker as well. What do you think his main strengths are? Well, he's, he's, he's got a, a real good physicality. He's very strong and powerful. And he's not just scoring goals. I think he's got, he penetrates teams, he opens and stretches teams well in the final, final uh, attacking line, which uh, allows um, others to benefit from that work rate. Um, he's growing all the time. He was. Um, his career has been going from, from his natal Senegal to Turkey and scoring a lot of goals there. He had a, a big step to the Russian league with the Lokomotiv and now we feel that is uh, the next step in his, in his career and uh, as, as, as a strong, powerful striker that he can play in different positions, as you, as you mentioned, is going to be a, a terrific addition, a fresh uh, addition into, into uh, a squad that, as I say, welcomes his, his ability as a player. Diamond, the first impressions or anything to go by. The boy looks a character, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I mean, he went on a lap of honour there, didn't he, <laughs> rather than anything else. And I'm sure that will hopefully be the first of, uh, of many for him. But no, he looks a confident lad. And uh, as the gaffer said there, full of energy and, and 
strong and what, what you tend to get with the, with the African based players is bundles of energy and a, and a huge desire in their game so I'm looking forward to seeing the young man play. The gaffer's record on the transfer market is very good isn't it? It is very good I mean when you look back you know since he's been at the club you know you look at the likes of Romelu coming in, James McCarthy, the loan signing of Gareth initially as well you know they're, they're British based players and international players alike, it doesn't matter, the gaffer's got a real good grasp of, of football as a whole and if you speak to him, you know, you recognise that pretty quickly. So, uh, there have been some, uh, some success stories, that's for sure. As I said, we probably don't know much about him. There won't be much the gaffer doesn't know about him, so thorough is his preparation work. Well, I think you have to be, don't you? Especially in the Premier League these days, you, you know, £13.5 million pounds is too much of a, mm. an outlay to be making mistakes, so the gaffer certainly would have done his homework, that's for sure. The best of luck to Omar Nias at Everton Football Club. And that's just about it for the first segment of this week's show. After a short break, we'll return with a look at the latest victory for the under-21s. We'll reflect on the FA Cup tie up at Carlisle United. And we'll hear how the Everton's Fans Forum did their bit for the Cumbrian flood relief projects. Welcome to the second part of this week's Everton show. On Monday night at Finch Farm, a blustery Finch Farm, Everton under-21s continued their recent excellent form with a hard-fought 2-0 victory against Manchester United. The game was switched to Finch Farm because the under-21s regular Southport home was waterlogged, but it didn't prevent the Young Blues recording an excellent victory over a United side, which included Adnan Yanazai. Everton began well, but had to wait until the 30th minute to take the lead, when Mason Holgate headed in Kieran Dowell's cross. United were probing for an equaliser after half-time, but it was Everton who struck a decisive second goal with 10 minutes to go, the goal coming via the head of Callum Dyson. He nodded in Sam Burns' cross to secure the victory and extend the unbeaten run to seven games. A fantastic, resilient performance. Um, you know, a, a backs to the wall, a, a work ethic, um, a commitment for the cause. Uh, two great goals um, and, and, and a great clean sheet. And, um, you know, we had the wind in the first half and it was really, um, you know, like a, like a hurricane really. Four is in the first half and then we had, to, we had to battle against it in the second half. So it really was a, a top battling performance um, and it was, a, it was great to get a clean sheet and it was great for the lads to get the win because they're in great form at the moment uh, and that's starting to show now with, with results against top teams and, and United are a top team. Uh, yeah, it was a good performance from us all. I thought from start we just dominated. Like, just wanted it more, got, got in the faces, didn't think they really liked it, but we did well in tough conditions, it was windy, so we had to play to them as well. Yeah, of course, we're in form ourselves, so it's, we kind of, every game now, we expect to win, so we come into the game wanting to win, we'd like to come out with 2-0 victory in the end. Grey Munsey's under-21s are really in the groove at the moment, that's four straight wins and you can't beat that sort of run. No, that's what you want. You want to teach your, your players, and especially your young players, to get into that win winning mentality. And clearly that was a big win for them. You know, and we talk about the mental side of things, and clearly they had the conditions to deal with as well. And, and they showed that they were strong, and they, their attitude was spot on as well. I was up at Finch Farm last week and talking to David, and he was, uh, he's been very impressed with a number of individuals in that under-21 side. You can't coach a winning mentality, can you? You can only prove it, I suppose. Well, you can. I mean, the whole the whole ethos at the, at the football club is to is to get a winning mentality into these players, and you know, so four on the spin is, is terrific. They'll look to continue that. Enjoy it while you can, because somewhere along along the line you're going to lose. That's the nature of football. But then you you set your ne next target to get on another winning run. Nice to see Liam Walsh scoring for Yeovil as well. He's on loan down there at Yeovil and he scored his first ever senior goal. It won't be his last. No, it won't be his last. Walsh is a, a top little player, and and. Again, we try and get these young players out, you know, in, uh, to experience some some real football. I like to call it in the in the nicest possible way to experience what it's like in in front of big crowds and, you know, uh, in, when it means a hell of a lot to the public to get you three points as well. So, Walsh, you'll do, uh, it'll be better for the experience, I'm sure. Just watching that clip there of the action against Manchester United, you could hear the wind blowing in the background. Even Unzi looked a little bit windswept. That I would presume is the worst condition for a footballer. Yes, it is, no doubt about it. You can take snow, you can take the rain, any kind of conditions, but the wind plays such a major part and it can ruin a game of football, both as a spectator and as a player as well. But, and that's why I say the mentality of the players clearly had to be good that night, and it was. And when the wind blows of Finch Farm, it certainly oh, blows, sorry. doesn't it? 
Well, Everton's fourth-round FA Cup tie at Brunton Park against Carlisle United was perhaps surprisingly selected for live television broadcast. Or maybe the television moguls were being a little bit mischievous and they sniffed a potential cup upset. Whatever, Everton certainly didn't read the script and in the event, the 3-0 outcome was every bit as comfortable as the scoreline would indicate. This is what Brian Oviedo made of it all. We come to here to the conviction to, to win the game. That is the most important we need. We need to play every game like, like today, I think. That they start the game in the beginning uh, with a winning mentality and continue like that in, in all the match. How pleased were you to get the assist for Aaron Lennon's goal? Well, uh, I'm happy to, to have that in with the assist. It's, it's very nice. And I hope so. I hope, hope so continue with... with uh, with the top level, I can't. All the time I try to play, continue for, for, for help the team. I think the last year was not no good for me because so many injuries, but now I, I feel more confident and every game I play, I feel better and better. You managed to get forward a lot, do a lot of attacking today. Did you enjoy yourself out there? Yeah, especially the first half was very, very good in the attacking. Uh, I need to continue like that and, and also work more hard. I think the most important for me is, is uh, being the in the team, in the squad, every, every game. You switched over to the right-hand side at the end and you played there in a couple of earlier games as well. How do you find it over on the right-hand side? Well, the moment, it's not an a, a easy position for me because I'm, I'm left-back, but uh, every time the mister needs to, to me to play there, I try to, to do the best for me and for the team. Uh, it's not easy, but now I'm, I'm a little more confident. just need to, to continue training or, or playing in the position for, for be better all the time. It's good for you though, isn't it? You want to play as much as possible, so if you can play in more than one position, you get more chances. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. If I have uh, two positions for play, it's more chances for me. And at the moment, uh, now, today was very difficult. It's not easy if uh, if a cup and, and away is so difficult. Graham, we'll talk about this tie very, very shortly, Everton and Carlisle in the FA Cup. But first of all, a quick word about Brian Oviedo. Oh, he's done terrific, hasn't he, Brian? It's always great to see him back. And we're always praying that he gets a good run of games mm -hmm. under his belt because he's had such a bad uh, run of luck with injuries and what have you. But whether it be left back, left sided midfield or right back, which can be difficult at times for a left footer, Brian never lets us down, does he? Mm. That was a banana skin of a tie, a potential upset in the FA Cup. We needed a good start and got one. We got the ideal start, didn't we? Aaron Lennon breaking down on the right-hand side, picks out Aruna Kone. Centre-forwards love a two-yard tap-in, don't they, as well? So, you know, that really settled everybody down, especially on the back of the Manchester City game. And, and the lads would have felt a little bit of pressure because they know that it was a potential banana skin, as I said at the top of the show. But uh, Aaron then gets a terrific second goal. It's, 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 it looks like an easy finish, but it's not because his first touch has to be absolutely perfect. Second touch goes in under the goalkeeper. And then Ross produced a little bit of magic for the third one, albeit with a little bit of a deflection, but we've seen that from Ross before. We know he's got dynamite in his, in his boots. The key word from the afternoon was control. We had to control the game and manage the game because one goal for Carlisle changes the whole atmosphere. Well, we saw that. We saw it at Chelsea, didn't we, when we played terrifically well and we get to a 2-0 lead and then Chelsea get one back and all of a sudden the wheels come off a little bit. So it was important that we saw the time out and manage the game as best we can. I think we, we restricted them to a, a few couple of half chances more than anything, but uh, a real good solid away performance. That's just exactly what you want in a cup. FA Cup round five, Bournemouth away. Could have been better, could have been worse. Yeah, I think when you get to the fifth round, you have to expect that you're going to get a, a, a decent side. Bournemouth are certainly that, and they're in a rich vein of form as well, it must be said. So it won't be easy, um, but I think we showed, especially in the early stages of the Premier League game, we, you know, we can go down there and it shouldn't hold any fears for us. Our, some of our best performances so far this season have come away from Goodison Park. I don't think I could stand another 3-3 draw at Bournemouth though, no, Graham. No, can't handle that. <laughs> the old ticker's not ready for that again. <laughs> It'll be a great tie whenever it's played, by the way. Well, that FA Cup fourth round tie at Carlisle was played in a true spirit of comradeship between the two sets of supporters. The Carlisle fans gave Ross Barkley a rousing reception when he was subbed in the second half. And for their part, the Evertonians had passed over a cheque in excess of £9,000 to help the football club rebuild after the terrible floods that hit the area. That figure is still rising by the way, so very well done to everyone involved. Now, Steve Clarkson is a Carlisle fan, Steve Soley is an Evertonian former Carlisle United player, and Peter Dodd is an Everton fans for Remember. You still with me? Well, between them, they tell us all about the fundraising work. 
Oh, we're delighted. Um, we um, set up the, the Just Given page just over a week or so ago, and within that time, we've raised £8,000 from, from the supporters of Everton. So it was, uh, we're delighted. I mean, having seen the difficulties that the club's been in, um, we're very happy with the, the generosity and the amount we've been able to, uh, to get from the club. Simon, how much of a difference will it make to the club? Well, it's just a fantastically kind gesture, and we've seen this throughout throughout football. Not just clubs hosting our home away games, but uh, sponsors and businesses, and and, and the, the efforts from individuals. You know, fans turned up in the hundreds down here to help clear the ground. Many of whom have have got their own personal devastations back at home. It's been a really galvanising experience from the manager and the players, everybody chipping in. It's just a, you know, a, a tremendous feeling, the spirit that's come through in, in really tough times. Steve, how important is it that the football family pulls together at times like this? Yeah, it's massively important and, and Everton have shown the way now and of, of, we're hoping that other clubs now join in and um, you know, put their hand in the pocket and raise some money. Like you said, coming down here, being from being afar, you, you don't really realise when you come down seeing all them skips and people living in the top floor of their houses, it you know, really it's home. So the football family now, you know, have got to help these people out. Graham, this is Brunton Park where we played Carlisle United last weekend. This was a few weeks before the tie. How did they get that game on? Oh, so an unbelievable effort from everybody concerned, volunteers alike up in, up in Carlisle. I'm sure the community up there came together and done everything they possibly could to, you know, to get that clean-up operation sorted out as quickly as can. Um, obviously, they got the pitch relayed as well. So mm. for us to you know, produce a gesture like, gesture like that, which is still ongoing, as you mentioned, Darren, was terrific from us, but uh, you know, richly deserved as well, because you can only imagine what the people have been through up there. It is a separate community, isn't it? The football community. It's so close, so close knit, so powerful at times. Well, it is, and it, and it's so it should be as well. I mean, you know, we're we're very fortunate. We're a Premier League club. We're playing, you know, football at a very very you know advantageous time financially as well. So. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these clubs get forgotten about a little bit down the line in terms of the finances, so it was good for us to pass some of that down. Nice gesture from the Carlisle supporters during the game. A little uh, courtesy that's often lost in the game. Ross Barkley gets substituted and the Carlisle fans gave him a, a great reception. Yeah, I mean, it's not every week they get the opportunity to see the likes of Ross Barkley. So, you know, Ross had a terrific game. He was, you know, I'm sure they were excited to see our players as, as much as how they would get on against us. But, uh, yeah, nice to see that. It's very rare, isn't it, that an opposing player gets, uh, gets clapped off. Played well, Ross, didn't he? He's in good form. He is in good form and he's scoring goals as well, which is important for him. And I think it, it shows a, a huge amount of character from Ross as well because he had a difficult time last season along with a few others. And he totally transformed his form um, and the thinking of everybody around the football club. And every credit goes to him. He can go from strength to strength. Confidence is a big part of his game, isn't it? And he certainly looks a confident boy right now. And that nicely brings us to the midway point in this week's Everton show. It's our popular big interview feature coming up after this short break. And this week we sit down with the most successful captain in the history of Everton Football Club. Welcome back to part three of this week's show and a big interview that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Now only Neville Southall, Brian Lebone, Dave Watson and Ted Sager have played more times for Everton Football Club than Kevin Ratcliffe. During his 493 first team appearances, Rats lifted two league titles, an FA Cup and of course a European trophy and he scored two goals. A lifelong blue, he's a regular at Goodison Park as often as his media commitments will allow. He sat down with the Everton show earlier this week and began by reflecting on the sad passing of Howard Kendall. The history that he created, everybody knows about, but you know, how cute he was in some sort of ways. You know, when you see this modern game now, um, there's a lot of good things and there's a lot of bad things. Um, he was a manager, he was a coach, he was a psychologist. Um, and he was somebody you could talk to. Um, he was everything, you know, to a lot of the lads. And when you think about it, you know, I was, it was twenty, I was twenty-three when he gave me the captaincy. Um, you know, there was a lot of lads, a lot younger than me. There was three or four lads younger than me. Um, but the main sort of part of us was was like in our sort of the, round about my age, twenty-three, twenty-four. Uh, I think Reedy and Andy Gray were 28, um, so you know they were the older statesmen, um, along with the lad Jim Arnold, who looked a lot older <laughs> than anybody. Um, so 
you know, but what he did is he actually brought in a responsibility. He gave us responsibilities, and uh, I'd like to think that we we paid him back in the way that he treated us. We were still really relatively young, but it was it was the way that he treated us and give us that little bit of a leeway to become adults uh, very very quickly. And uh, like I said, that was uh, you know I don't know if it was fortuitous or he knew exactly what he was doing, but. Uh, Knowing him, he most probably knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, and you talk about that camaraderie. I think that's one of the things that came out of every anecdote um, about sort of Howard's time as a player, Howard's time as a manager, and particularly that group of lads in the eighties. That camaraderie and yeah, that it just didn't closeness. Come. That's the one thing. It didn't come overnight. Mm. He worked at it um, from the state of playing a game, uh, an away game. On the way, uh, when we got back to Belfield, we all had to go to uh, the pub for a pint, even if it was only just one. You know, it was one or two stayed for three or four, <laughs> but usually it was just the one. And he would sit there, you'd have the pint, he would buy the round, and then you could go. Um, the, you know, the famous Chinese we had, they were usually coming around when things weren't going quite well. There was a sticky patch. Um, so there was a good, good thing about them, but a bad thing really on the football inside, because usually the things weren't going quite well, and he wanted it to find out maybe off one or two of the lads. You know, he's quite cute in that way. Um, but the way that he galvanised the team, nobody was treated really any differently. Um, and he, 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 was a, he was a hard taskmaster. If you didn't do what he asked him, you were out. There was no danger about that, you were out. Uh, out of the team, you could be out of the club. You know, he, he was a stiff disciplinarian. Um, and, you know, if you, if you cross that line the wrong way, then you you got to pay for it. And the good thing about him that he had disciplinarians within the team as well, um, notably everybody, because you you'd be a second late, and everybody wanted you to pay the fine. Um, you know, they, it, I always I was thinking these days, it, you, you know, people see it as a grass for doing that, but it, it was all part of the team building. Did that make it an easy team to captain? No. Pretty easy, you know. When you're in a successful side and things are running smoothly, there's not a lot you have to do as captain. Um, not that I thought there was any different than what I was doing anyway. And you know, I've seen captains, you know, like Mick Lyons, who maybe took it on to a different level. I always thought Lyons he was a perfect captain. You know, whatever was going on, he'd be there. He'd be at hospitals. He'd be, at, he'd be, you know, sort of coffee mornings or, or whatever, whatever he could do. Uh, for Everton fans, he'd be there, you know. In fact, I, th I thought I, he did a little, I didn't want to get too involved in that side. But Lyons, he was a perfect captain in that way. But you take the good things, um, you know, fr from them. And like you say, you your time's your own as well. So you've got to, but, uh, yeah, I thought I handled it quite, pretty well. I think, you know, over the time it's proved that it, it worked. But, uh, you know, it's got to work bef between everybody, the players, the manager and the captain and the club so yeah. and looking at that team you mentioned how young everybody was in that team I think we forget how young a number of players in that team were and then we look at the current Everton team and there are a lot of young players uh -huh. is is that something that is is good for the team to have so many so much young blood at the same time yeah I, I think that uh, it's got to be blended in with a bit of experience around there you know Jags is important I think Tim Howard's important as well um, you know that that you need them type of players. Um, we we had Reedy, we had Andy Gray that had come in on loan. Terry Curran come in, um, although you know maybe Terry wasn't a regular uh, earlier on. Dave Johnson was there at the football club. You know these these players who had got experience were coming in. Um, you know, and maybe you know Howard didn't realise how quickly these players were actually going to progress. And I think that's what maybe hit Howard. Um, because remember, he brought in quite a number of players when he first signed, um, and I think we just progressed maybe too quick. And these players were really, you know, I wouldn't say they were bad signings, um, but you know, the younger lads, um, myself, I think Kevin Richardson, you know, Trevor Stephen, who was a buy, Gary Stevens, you know, Graham Sharp, you know, coming in, um, Steve McMahon was one of them, you know, but he was. You know, we, he was let go. Um, so, you, you know, it was it was one of them that I think we, and especially the likes of Gary and and um, 
Gary Stevens and uh, Kevin Richardson, you know, because they were like two, three years younger than the likes of myself. So, you know, Kevin Richardson, I think, was only about 20, 21 when he played in the cup final. Same with Gary Stevens, Derek Mountfield. I mean, looking back to that 83-84 uh, season that started terribly, it, things looked pretty grim. Mm -hmm. and then there was this a cup run that almost galvanised the confidence and galvanised the team unit. It, you, you know, there's a bit of luck along the way. You know, you've got to have that luck. It doesn't matter what team you're in. You've got to have that luck. He just Howard could not get the blend in midfield that actually that he wanted. And I, I think that against Coventry, when Reedy come on in the third round of the, the the League Cup, that you know that was a turning point. Reedy was a starter, but before that, Reedy wasn't a starter. You know, he was really sort of being couldn't really get the right blend. You know, in midfield, and when I think him and Rico hit it off, and then I think when Kev Sheedy picked up an injury, Rico went out to the left wing, and I think we dropped uh, Adrian Heath into midfield because Inchi wasn't having a, a great time up front as in scoring goals. He was a great player to play with, but I think he was missing too many chances, and to relieve the pressure off Inchi, he dropped him into midfield, and it worked the treat. And I, Sometimes you just fall upon things. I think that was a night that he fell upon Reedy, being Reedy what he was for the football club. Graham, we've said this before, it doesn't matter what guests we have on the Everton show. If they've got anecdotes or stories or reflections about Howard Kendall, we could listen to them all day. Of course, and yet another player who, who Howard had a huge impact on his life and his career. And Howard, as you heard in the piece there, gave him the captaincy at 23 years of age. I didn't realise that at the time, but... Uh, you know, that, that's a big ask for Kevin. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, it's important because as a, if you're going to announce as a captain, you've got, to, you, you've got to make sure he's got a, a strong character about him, especially at 23 years of age, in and around the kind of experienced players, your Andy Grays and your Peter Reeds, who might look down and think, hang on a minute, 23 years of age, well, you know, I should have been the captain. Mm. But Kevin clearly, as we saw over the years he played for us, was a strong character, could deal with the situation, never let the captaincy affect his game. That's important as well. It was a great decision, a brave decision by Howard to make a 23-year-old captain. Do you think Howard will have spoken to Reedy and Andy and said, this is what I'm going to do? Maybe we did. We'll never know. Um, I mean, I think Howard was strong enough to just make his own decisions and he didn't really care if it upset anybody. You know, that's what he was going to do and he had the courage of his convictions. But then again, another part of me thinks Howard being Howard would have pulled Reedy and Andy Gray and said to him, listen, just to mark your card here, this is what I'm thinking about doing, just out of respect for them as well. Lovely little tale about the players coming back to Belfield after an away game. Everybody going to the pub, even if it's only for one. Yeah. And how would play such importance on camaraderie at the time, and I would think in your day as well. Very much so, yeah. I mean, he, he, he was a real players person, Howard. We've, we've talked about this before, but he really was, and it was important. He, he, off the park was every bit as important off, on the park to Howard because he recognised that that's where you built your team spirit. And he wanted everybody together. Even if you didn't fancy having a pint, you know, just add the one and then get yourself off. I think Kev was, you know, lying a little bit about the three <laughs> or four. I'm, I'm thinking more eights and nines myself. But uh, no, it, that was all part of Howard's, you know, m you know, mental thinking, you know, to, to make sure everybody's together. You know, we all stick together as a side. And then on a Saturday afternoon when you need it, you're all digging in together. Number five in the all-time Everton appearance list, 493 games, two goals. Surely you'd, you'd fluke a couple <laughs> along the way somewhere, wouldn't you? You'd like to think so somewhere. Even Snod scored more than two. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, you offset that with the fact that Derek Mountfield played an awful lot of games alongside Kev and we know how prolific Derek was as a centre-half. Then Dave Watson comes along and, and Waggy scored his fair few as well. So, uh, you know, Kev did what he did best, defended really, real, really well, good pace, organised everybody around him. So... Uh, we can't have too much of a go about him, about his two goals. Come on, Des. Well, one was against Liverpool, so we'll oh, forgive well. him anything. You mentioned Waggy there, Dave Watson. Was he the best skipper you had? I think so. Yeah, I'm a, an imposing figure. You know, somebody you walked in the dressing room and you, you, you looked at him and you knew he was your captain. Mm. You know, he, he, if, if Waggy said something to you, you listened and you took it on board. And if you didn't, you were getting a clip round the ear <laughs> next time. So, you know, he, and, and he led by example on the park as well. Um, again, somebody you could deal with the pressures of being the captain. He was eight out of ten every week, so he was consistent. Uh, no, terrific captain, and, and he got the bonus ball at the end of it all and picking that cup up in 1995, which was terrific for him. 
He's still got that aura about him, hasn't he, Waggy? He still fills any room he walks into. <laughs> and that's just about it for part three. You've got just enough time to put the kettle on before we're back with part four when we reflect on the Newcastle win with Ross and the boss and we start the countdown to our visit to Stoke City on Saturday with James McCarthy. <laughs> Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this week's Everton show. While well, certain pundits were labelling our Barclays Premier League fixture with Newcastle United on Wednesday night as a must-win game for the Blues. But if the pressure was on, it certainly didn't show on the pitch. The Toffees won 3-0, it was a thoroughly deserved three points, and this is the post-match appraisal of Roberto Martinez. Well, I think it was a very important game for us. Three points that I think they are more significant than just a win, uh, where we are in the table, where... But we're looking forward to to try to to get this season. I thought it was a real a real important point in our campaign. Um, we were facing a team that they had a lot of time to prepare this game. We had two cup competitions. Uh, Newcastle worked really really well and, and and for ten days. And you could see that early on in the game uh, they were well organised. But I thought the way we managed the game was probably what we missed in 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 all the home performances this campaign. We kept that really. Good clean sheet. We defended well. We we created chances, and probably the second goal would have changed completely the the scoreline a lot earlier. But it was a really mature performance, a performance that it shows that we've learned a lot of how we have to play at home and how how we have to use our our quality. But the work rate and the intensity of our performance was very impressive. Um, the amount of games that we have in a short period of time, being able to perform in that manner, is very pleasing to to see. Three worthy points and, and for me a, a real start uh, in how we should be from now to the end of the season at home at Goodison. Another six vital games and I hope that we can make our, our fans enjoy our football, enjoy our wins and, and, and make sure that everyone is proud of, of this good group of players that in my eyes are one of the most talented squads that we, we've ever had. Umar watching on from the stands will have been mightily impressed surely with what he saw from his new teammates. Well it's important to 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 allow him to feel at home and to allow him to understand Everton. He's been watching us from afar and I think today to get that feel of, of understanding Goodison is a, a real good introduction. I saw him before and he was very touched and he felt uh, that he's ready to, to to get on the pitch and help the team. Um, I think we, it's quite, quite in, uh, important to get that first impression as a player to our fans and the same way as a player to get that feel of, of the fans was was a real good start. Looking forward to seeing him training tomorrow. Does Ross Barkley's second penalty highlight just how confident he is in the level he's playing at, at this moment in time? Well, I think Ross, obviously, 100 games in the Premier League today is a, is a big landmark at the age of 22. For me, Ross is not a young man anymore with potential. He's, he's a, a reality. He's a, a very important player for us with an incredible uh, focal point in our team. The way he played throughout the game was very impressive and just highlights the consistency that he had this season. And the, the second penalty is just uh, a very confident man with an incredible technical ability. But I think Ross, Ross's performances, uh, they gone into a different level from where he was last season. That probably was a, a young man with a lot of potential. I think now is a, a reality that we can, we can all be very, very proud of at Everton. Graham, we used the word control when we discussed the Carlisle United FA Cup tie a little bit earlier in the show. And I think the word control was very much applicable on Wednesday night because at 1-0, it's a little bit edgy, especially for Everton. <laughs> yeah, well, we never do anything <laughs> easily, do we, as, as Evertonians? But certainly, especially the first half, I felt we were in totally dominant in the game. I think it was unfortunate that we hadn't got that second goal that we probably deserved on over overall play in that first 45 minutes. But you knew that Newcastle were going to come out in that second half and that's where you get that little bit of edginess until we go ahead and score that second goal. But overall, you know, I don't remember Joel having to make too many vital saves. So I think we defended very well. I think we were, you know, impressive going forward at times as well and uh, could have scored more. On many occasions, you've championed the cause of Aaron Lennon. Made one, scored one against Carlisle. Made one, scored one against Newcastle. He's, uh, he's in good nick. I think he's in good nick. I like Aaron, I always have done. I think he gives you a bit of both. I think he can, you know, he can excite in, in attacking areas as, as he's made, made a name for himself, but defensively as well. His work rate is, is unbelievable. You know, he's not afraid to put his foot in. He'll do a good shift for the team. Any player is vital to you like that. 
Clean sheet was important, wasn't it? Vitally important, yeah. Gives everybody confidence at the back. Well, those two late penalties from Ross Barkley have moved the young midfielder into double figures for goals this season, and that's for the first time in his professional career. After the game, Ross spoke to the TV cameras about the win and about his audacious second spot kick. Just playing with a bit of confidence now, and I felt comfortable doing that and for the last pen, but the main thing was just winning the game, and we did that, and we kept the clean sheet, which is a confidence boost for the whole team. Yeah, the second goal took a while to come, but when you factor in the amount of times you've hit the woodwork, that, that could have been 4 or 5 nil tonight. Yeah, we, we knew that it was coming. We, we had a few chances, and um, the, the keeper pulled off a few great saves, but we still um, pushed for the second goal and the third, and we got them in the end. Do you think with the you know good performance against Manchester City, even though you go to the cup, obviously you win then in the in the FA Cup. Do you think a corner is being turned at the moment by Everton? Yeah, yeah, we're just focusing on each game as it comes and trying to get three points in each game. Um, but today, main thing for us was getting the three points, which we did do. And have you scored one of those Peneca penalties before? Yeah, I'm only at the training ground. Yeah. <laughs> That's a young man full of confidence, as that demonstrates. Yeah, very much so. I mean, you can afford yourself the. Uh, the time to do that when it's the last, pretty much the last <laughs> kick of the game. What impressed me more, Darren, was the first one, because Ross sprinted across to go and get that ball, and he knew it was going to be a vital penalty because, as we've already mentioned, at one nil there's there's st still that air of you know fear that you know they can break away and score the goal that they wouldn't have deserved on the night. But uh, so for Ross to bury the second, pe uh, the first penalty to put us two nil up showed me that he's a man who's who's prepared to take the responsibility of getting us over the line. I remember when John Stones did that, but it was a pre-season friendly, albeit against Juventus, but it was a pre-season friendly in San Francisco. If you're going to try that penalty in the Premier League, it's got to come off, hasn't it? Well, it's got to come off because otherwise you end up with egg on your <laughs> face. But, you know, in John Stones and Ross Bartley, we've got two prestigious talents and two young men full of confidence and not, uh, not afraid to sh express that. Double figures for goals as well. Brilliant. Really, really good. If you're, a, if you're an attacking midfield player, you've got to be scoring a, a, a minimum of six to eight goals a, a season. And Ross has uh, eclipsed that already. And, you know, there's no reason why he can't, can't be looking at 15, 16 mm. goals for the season. And that would be a really, really good return for the young man. I'm sure Roy Hodgson is just as pleased as Roberto Martinez. Well, this weekend takes us up to the Britannia Stadium to face Stoke City. It's a showdown, of course, between the beaten semi-finalists in the Capital One Cup. And it's a way fixture that Everton haven't won since 2008. I can tell you Segundo Castillo, remember him, he was in the Blues team that day. Well, a key figure this time around will be James McCarthy. His return to match fitness has been most welcome for Roberto Martinez, given that the unfortunate Mo Besic faces another spell on the sidelines. Our Irish international midfielder is looking forward to the always challenging visit to Stoke at the weekend. It's never been an easy place to go, Stoke. And uh, as I say, this, the next two games are crucial. Um, and we'll, we look forward to them. We talked about bad luck earlier on, that possible that we were wrongly um, penalised, given a penalty against us against Stoke last time. Is it a case that we want to right that wrong? Yeah, what I said, it's, just, it's always, always frustrating uh, losing games and, um, and on the day we, we, we could have nicked it. Um, and obviously we've ended up losing it, which is, is very frustrating. But as you say, it's, it's a few decisions have maybe cost us um, that one um, at home against Stoke, which didn't go our way, but now we look forward to to going there and uh, addressing things and uh, trying to take maximum points there. It was a crazy game. If you look at Stoke over the years when you've played against them, have you seen a change in them under Mark Hughes? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a passing side now. and um, Obviously, back in the day when they used to uh, it used to be a lot of long, long balls, but to be fair to them, they got results and um, they're getting results now uh, with the new style of play. But as I say, no matter what, it's, just, it's going to be a tough game and um, any, any stroke side you've ever faced is, is, is always going to be tough. Graham, as I mentioned in the introduction to the piece of film there with James McCarthy. We've not won at the Britannia since 2008. It just always seems a difficult place to go. Well, it is. That's because it is. You know, I've been there as a player myself and it is tough going down there. You know, it's not the most appealing of places to play football, if I'm totally honest with you. But we've got to, we've got to turn that round and we've got to go and take the momentum from Wednesday night against Newcastle into that game Saturday and get ourselves further up that table because we're more than capable of doing that. What adds to the difficulty of playing Stoke City away is the locals 
they can make a noise, can't they? They do make a noise, and a you know, terrific fan base there down at Stoke, and old Delilah will be roaring out, <laughs> won't it? So, um, but we've got to quieten them down. First and foremost, that first 20 minutes, we've got to try and quieten the crowd down and give ourselves an advantage. Um, you know, we've got some terrific players. You know, young Ross there is in good form, and you know, Romelu hopefully will be back as well after he's picking up a little bit of a niggle Wednesday night. And we've got to give ourselves a platform and, a, and an opportunity to pick up another three points. Just concentrate on our own game, basically. That's it. Look after yourself. If we do what we can do well, we're always going to give ourselves a chance to pick up three points, and hopefully the lads will do that Saturday. Stoke City versus Everton at the Britannia at the weekend. And that's just about it for another Everton show. It's been a good week, hasn't it? There's a real feeling that the second half of the season is underway now and that the Blues have a terrific platform on which to build a strong, exciting finish to the campaign. Thanks for joining us again this week. My thanks to the Diamond for his company. And by the way, next week we'll be joined on the Everton show sofa by David Unsworth. We'll see you then. <laughs>